Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. It's uh, Roxanne Durhage of Authentic Living with Roxanne. Uh, how are you today? Uh, today I have a special colleague, Ron Sang, on uh, my podcast. Hi, Ron. How are you? I'm great, Roxanne. How are you? Good, thank you. So, Ron um, is. Uh, he, I'm a member of uh, Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, and Ron is our uh, president of the Toronto chapter. So Ron uh, has a unique background and he, he's a specialist in communication and I'm going to just tell you a little bit about his background. Um, so he r- has written a book and it's called From Presentation to Standing Ovation, 15 Actionable Steps to Achieve Massive Influence. So how do we influence others? He helps executives, employees and entrepreneurs uh, present even better than Steve Jobs. Wow. Amazing. Uh, Some of Ron's uh, clients are global fortune 500 banks, insurance companies, tech companies, associations, and nonprofits. Um, And like I said, he's the co-founder of Share, Love, and Celebrate, which I'd love to hear more about, which is an annual charity fundraiser and the Toronto Entrepreneurs of Passion and Purpose Awards, which I don't know much about, Ron, which I'd love to hear more about. So, Ron, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thanks so much for having me, Roxanne. So, Ron, I'm going to say, um, focusing on an area that I think all of us want to get better at, um, including myself, which is to be able to captivate or hold the attention of people when I'm communicating in whatever element that I, I, I'm speaking, whether I'm speaking or whether I'm meeting a, a someone for business or those types of things. So how did you, how did you kind of get into this whole field of communication? Well, there's kind of a philosophical answer and there's sort of a a timeline practical answer. And I would say that from a timeline perspective, a chronological perspective, I wasn't always a good speaker. So even though I'm a professional speaker now and I'm a speaker who speaks on speaking and I help leaders speak better and present better, I wasn't a great speaker to begin with. I'm not a natural born speaker. Many people aren't. But I became a serious student of speaking when I realized that it was something that was holding me back. When I was in high school, for example, I was very shy and I start, my voice started to get deeper and I started, to, I mumbled quite a bit and I'm an only child. So at home, my, my, my parents kept asking me to repeat myself and repeat myself, repeat myself. They, they didn't understand what I was saying. They kept asking me to repeat myself over and over again. And that, that sense of frustration really, really stuck with me and led me to want to become a serious student of speaking. And that's sort of how I, Sort of that, 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 that's something that, uh, that stayed with me and sort of led me to um, one of the, it was one of the waypoints, one of the reasons why I decided to be uh, focused on communication because I wasn't always a good communicator. And it helps me be more empathetic to people who want to get better as well. And philosophically, a speaker saved my life. When I was, when I was very young, I was uh, about a year and a half, my parents discovered that I had a high grade continuous fever and no other symptoms except for swollen lymph glands. So at, at the best hospital in the city, the, the doctor thought that it was meningitis. So they, they gave me in antibiotics in an IV tube. They gave me a chest X-ray, and they even did a spinal puncture. But mm-hmm. the tests were inconclusive. The antibiotics were ineffective, and the doctors didn't know what to do. After two weeks of this high-grade fever with no other symptoms, the... Doctors noticed that my hands and feet started to, the skin in my hands and feet started to peel off like a glove. Hmm. And they noticed that the skin in my tongue and lips turned as red as a strawberry. Wow. And, and that's when after two weeks, when these new symptoms emerged, that uh, the doctor realized that uh, he, he recognized these symptoms because he'd just come back from a medical conference where he heard a speaker share information about a rare new pediatric disease called Kawasaki disease. Okay. And the doctor said to my parents, okay, well, Kawasaki disease causes heart attacks in, in little children. 
um, your boy could die from a heart attack. Wow. But we, we think we can save him. And what I, what I really believe is that if that doctor at that medical conference, that speaker was too shy, not afraid to, he was, that person was too afraid to speak or not able to articulate themselves clearly, or they weren't able to convince the audience that this is something worth paying attention to. And that this is something that could be addressed, solved. I wouldn't be here. Wow. That's, that's a powerful story. Yeah, thanks, Roxanne. I, I, I'm, I'm the first wow. survivor of Kawasaki disease in Canada. Wow. If it wasn't for that, that, that doctor, it wasn't for that speaker, I wouldn't be here. There's no, there's no way I'd be here. The doctors that, that were treating me had no idea what was going on. So, so that's why. It's not interesting though, right? Because a lot of times, um, a lot of, for, for instance, physicians, I don't know about you, but I, I know a lot of times the doctors that I've had over my life, they're not very good at um, articulating a lot of things, right? Like, they're not, they, that would, they would, that would be a skill that I would think that physician would have had to develop in order to go to that platform. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I agree. But what I, what I appreciate about the medical community is that they don't hold information back. They, they share it with others in, in many mm -hmm. organizations that you and I may have experienced or worked with before uh, people tend to hold information to themselves, mm -hmm. but in order for science and medicine to advance, they have to continually communicate either in writing or in speaking the spoken word at conferences and, and events. And that's why it, it's so important because you never know who's listening to you and you never know what the ripple effect is of your message, your voice, your ideas. So that's why it's so critical that we communicate, that we, that we remember that our, our voice is more important than we know. And you know, it, you know, one thing I, I speculate on just in his listening to you, you know, I think that, um, Myself growing up, I love to speak, but I was always um, shy, right? And I wonder, with, with us being around our colleagues, that a lot of us are professional speakers, how many people were actually like us growing up and, you know, ended up going and perfecting their craft? And, and, and I have seen, you know, phenomenal speakers around us. Like, we are surrounded. And I feel blessed to be involved with us, um, you know, at CAPS because, I'm oftentimes blown away by people that they get up there and you're so captivated by their stories. And it makes me wonder, that would be something that we could talk about. I would ask people about in the future is how many people were actually kind of shy growing up and, and learning to speak? Because it would be interesting to hear that story. That'd be a great question to ask. I'm sure there will be fascinating stories to hear about <laughs> people's journeys. Many professional speakers that I do know, they are shy or they are introverts. And just mm -hmm. because they get up on stage and they get paid to speak to audiences of many sizes, they don't necessarily seek the spotlight except for either to share a message because it's in line with their, what they believe their purpose is or because they're, they're doing it to make money. It's a mm -hmm. business. For sure. So the power of the voice, like we know, is so very important, right? Like, you know, I, even when, you know, raising children, I have a, a, an 18-year-old son, you know, I really, he's very, I, I would say I'm more extroverted, he's a bit more introverted, and he, and he would say, hey, mommy, I'm not like you. But I often, you know, think about kind of in my career, even as a psychotherapist or even as a consultant, how important it is to learn to speak effectively. And you use the word influential. So I want to just chat about that concept of influence in reference to communication and what kind of things people listening to us, whether it's talking to your child, trying to get them to brush their teeth, or, you know, you're talking to a CEO that's about to, you know, deliver some really bad news. What are some of the core elements that you think that you could share with us around the concept of influence? Well, I think it's important to understand that communication and influence is not about reading minds. I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make when it comes to communication, influential communication, is assuming that just because you say something or write something, your audience will understand, they'll comply, they will act. And that's simply not the case. We, we need a sender and a receiver in this communication model. We have to get ideas from our mind, transferred, transmitted, and interpreted into the minds of other people. And we have to, that means we have to really understand our audience, understand how we come across, understand how receptive they are, understand the best channels to, to communicate in and understand how we can make sure that we can achieve shared meaning and shared understanding. 
And with, when it comes to influence, we need to have a clear goal in mind. What's our purpose or what's our target outcome? What's, what's the business objective? And we have to understand what our audience is looking for, whether we're communicating with one person or with a thousand people, what are they looking for? What are their needs? What problems do they have? Or what opportunities might exist in their minds? So understanding that along with our own objectives can help us create a GPS to go from where we are to where we want to go or where our audience is and where they want to go. And it helps to not only understand our audience and understand where we want to go and understand their problems with empathy, it also helps to, to tap into what Aristotle referred to as three of the basic elements of persuasion, credibility, logic, and emotion. So mm. once we understand our audience and understand, have, have empathy for themselves and understand our own objectives, then we can start to think about what we want our audience to think or to feel or how we want them to act, what we want them to do, and then structuring our messages in a way that will be received well by our audiences so that they, we, we form a connection with them. Initially, they get it. We, we hook their attention. Perhaps we build their interest. We share what's in it for them so that they can, can see why they would want to do something and then make it easy for them to do that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a basic question because <laughs> a lot of times when, um, if you haven't studied communication and, uh, you know, you being a, a business communication expert and I'm a psychotherapist, right? And, and that has been in consulting. The average person doesn't know a lot of the things that we're talking about, right? They're mm -hmm. like, you know, if I'm a manager and I have to deliver a message, oftentimes it's very in the past, I should say, I think we've, we're coming along in, in corporations today, but it's generally, I have a, a message to deliver. I need to share it to the front line. I'm going to tell you kind of what's expected of you. But what you're talking about here is a very didactic kind of interface. So for the average person kind of communicating, say, for the first time in that role, that's a skill that I would say is kind of high level at first. So how do we kind of stay away from kind of talking to people versus kind of receiving as much as, as, as uh, communicating with someone? Well, I think it helps to ask questions mm -hmm. to, to, to sort of have an understanding of, of, of what, uh, where they are and, and where they want to go or, or what their level of understanding is mm -hmm. of, of the situation or potentially posing a, a situation, some background, some context, and then getting their thoughts, their feedback, if they, if they want to collaborate. So mm -hmm. understanding our own leadership style and the, and the communication style or the behavioral tendencies of the people that we want to influence, we want to communicate with, really helps as well. So certainly it, it makes sense to structure a business message a certain way, but it, it also makes sense to, to discover how to collaborate with them as well. I think it depends on the situation. These tools are appropriate for different situations, for different mediums and different people as well. I mean, we are who we are, and it really helps understand our own communication strengths and weaknesses, our own styles as well. For sure. Because if, you know, if you're kind of um, the type that maybe um, is pretty direct, it'd be easy to share certain messages, but then sometimes you might miss certain implicit things that maybe potentially is happening in your body. Like, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm saying, I'm so happy to see you Ron, but I'm kind of like you're closed off or I'm like, Oh, nice to see you Ron, but I'm averting my eye. Those times. Those types of things, it's, it's kind of like, you're going to say, okay, Roxanne, you're not really into seeing me today, are you? But it's about getting comfortable to just not with the spoken word, what's actually coming out of the person's mouth, but to really kind of be um, able to recognize, like, you know, like you said, like a roll of an eye or a diverted look where I'm, I'm looking away as you're in the middle of a sentence, those types of things. Do you find that um, when you're teaching your courses, what's the hardest part to teach? Is it nonverbal communication do you find that the most difficult or verbal communication or is it like a combination of, of things that's um difficult to teach I, I often speak about three m's in successful communication mindset motivation and mechanics so we're looking at the if we're looking at the nonverbal communication how people sound how they come across with their, with their hands and feet or with their expressions that's often the nonverbal communication. Those are mechanics mm -hmm. or how to structure a message so that it's understood or that people take action on, on it. That's also mechanics. But in terms of how people feel about themselves mm -hmm. or about public speaking or about winning over an audience, that's mindset. 
and whether or not people want to do it, if there's a compelling reason for them to do it, that's motivation. And I often share that if I can teach you the mechanics, but you don't have the mindset or the motivation, then we can only get so far. But combined together, all three M's will really accelerate your success. So in terms of commonalities, what I find is some people are missing some of the M's. Some people don't have the mindset for whatever reason. They've got limiting beliefs and that holds them back. Some people have, um, they don't have a motivation. They don't have a, a real clear reason to improve what they're doing. And it could be that they're comfortable in their jobs, they're comfortable in their roles, they're not challenged. So they don't need to get any better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for the mechanics, some people just, they're, they're not aware. So many executives have had some kind of public speaking or presentation skills coaching involving video sessions, involving feedback from an executive coach. And so they, they improve, but most employees don't get tapped on the shoulder for those opportunities. And unless they get, some employees get stuck, they can't get a promotion. They can't, I, I don't know, they're, they're not able, they're not, they're not put in front of cross-functional teams because they're very, very technical, for example, then they, realize, they may realize that what's holding them back is their communication skills. So they actively seek out to improve their mechanics. It could be how they come across their body language. Maybe they come across being defensive. They, at, at, at business meetings, they're, they're not actively engaged. They're crossing their arms, they're rolling their eyes. They don't realize that it holds them back. So that's, that could be the mechanics, uh, the nonverbal communication. Um, for, for mindset as well some people think that they are already really good i remember going to a session for with a large financial institution and i do pre-event surveys and i kind of have an idea where people are based on the survey and one person basically gave himself 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 so i'm wondering why is he here <laughs> is he a prisoner he's being forced to attend the session okay i'll be interesting and i noticed he didn't take any notes at all during the sessions whereas everyone else actively going through the workbook and taking the time to answer questions and he really didn't improve at all because he didn't see a need to improve. So sometimes everybody's a little bit different. And I think it's important to recognize that, but you know, it's, it's helpful to have an open mind, to be mindful of our own strengths, weaknesses, how we naturally come across and then what our mindset motivation and then what mechanics we need to improve in would be. So now I know that that's so important because you're right. Because if you're, if, if I'm working for you and I have to be at the training that in a way I kind of feel like I'm mandated to be there. So my motivation may not be in sync with what potentially the company is wanting. And I go in and I'm just going to, I'm just going to kind of tick the box and, and, you know, say that I was at the training versus if I really, really want to improve or that I know that potentially I'm not able to connect with my team or I went up for that promotion twice and, you know, twice I missed it by, you know, maybe a mark or two, but it's not specific. So I could see how that it could be either one of those three things. So with the, with someone that's maybe listening and they're trying to gauge their communication, how could they kind of, I'm going to use the word self-diagnose their capacity to communicate. What, what, are there some steps that you can share with us that would help them kind of think about where they are in, around those three areas? Well, I think it helps to get feedback from your boss or from your colleagues, for example. If you have a performance review, it's, it's worth asking, is this an area of growth? Mm -hmm. How would you rate me? How would you rate my ability to connect and engage, to, to convince how do you rate my, am I friendly? How's my demeanor? Mm -hmm. and, and solicit either numbers or qualitative feedback. And that can help because sometimes we have blind spots. We just don't know. We just don't know. And by sort of increasing our awareness of these blind spots, we can increase our own awareness as well. So feedback, right? Because like you're right, maybe when I'm stressed, I'm, I'm, less, I'm, I'm less open or maybe I'm closed off. So getting that feedback if I'm on your team um, to get that constructive uh, criticism is a good thing because that gives me an element to open up. Well, I can get better in this area because maybe every quarter if I'm in the financial sector and it's crunch time, I kind of seal off and maybe I don't, I'm not as open with people and then I get perceived as, aloof or um, unreachable, that kind of feedback is really, really good for me because then I, I can be aware that I need to check in with myself when I'm kind of communicating with my team and when there's deadlines or those types of things. So just 
um, asking people around you, and I'm sure even um, asking people at home, right? It's, we're talking about the workplace, but who to, who to know you better, it, you know, other than your, your partner, your children, or your friends, or even family around you, because they'd be able to give you the straight up goods, I would say, about what you do well, and maybe areas that you can improve on. Absolutely. Absolutely. The challenge I find is that some managers or leaders who, ha- who manage direct reports may have, they may feel uncomfortable in providing that feedback to someone else, either because they themselves don't know how to provide the, the, the quantitative and qualitative feedback to help mm. that direct report grow, or just because they don't feel comfortable providing constructive feedback. And that can be a challenge then, because how can someone grow if they're not getting that feedback? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it really helps to have open conversations with with your your, your seniors or with your direct reports, and it, it, it's helpful for people at all levels of the organization to have that open mindedness about improving their communication skills and how, how they come across. Perhaps a, a 360 evaluation can really mm-hmm. open people's eyes. I often say, you know, if I'm in, if if there's an area of of um, that I need to improve on, like you said, quality. And quantity, right? So you're not just looking at, oh, Roxanne seems to be a nice person, which is great. Maybe I score really, really good there. But when you kind of look at my mechanics, there, I, I may be kind of lacking in certain areas. So I think I like the fact that you say both quantitative and qualitative. That sounds um, something that for myself, I think it, it, learning to communicate better would be something that I can actually work on. We all, we all have our natural strengths. And if, yeah. if you come across, I mean, if, if you're a nice person, if you're an authentic person, if you live authentically, <laughs> then uh, which that's I a great foundation. I, yeah, which I would hope I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm on the right podcast, Living Authentically <laughs> with Roxanne Deraj. I'm going to, I, I know you do um, intercultural or cross-cultural communication. And I want to chat a little bit about that and kind of, obviously, you know, you're in, you're in Toronto. Um, I'm in Niagara, but most companies today, I would say with globalization have, we have remote teams, we have uh, different cultures, we have different time zones. Um, you know, I, I, when I worked uh, in my consulting firm, I, my assistant was in Toronto. So talk about, I felt kind of, um, it was like a new role for me because I was like, oh, I can see you face to face. There was an element that I thought I was a better communicator in, in person. And then I had to learn how to um, actually uh, manage uh, my portfolio by having her remote. I was not very good at it, Ron, because it, it was difficult for me. I needed to create, create structure and things like that, that I, I really felt a bit inept. And I, I stumbled at the beginning. How did you overcome that? Was it was the challenge in knowing when to communicate with some with your assistant who wasn't there face to face, or was it something else? I think you know. I think knowing my personality, I'm a big picture kind of person. So I was you know an executive on uh, with companies, and I would deal with strategy. So and she was microscopic, so she would tether me, and I would have to kind of go out and talk to you know about trending analysis on wellness, and you know talk about. Um, the recommendations, let's say we found it was work-life balance around um, that we needed to create a strategy, say in banking, for instance, or whatever. So we had to work collegially. But I think sometimes what I had to hear really was that I was not a good communicator in reference to the microscopic things that needed to get done because I was off and running to the next meeting. So we really had to create um, structure. We So we created a uh, a kind of a system which helped me really um, beginning of the week we sat and we did about an hour and a half long meeting because I managed about 40 accounts um, sometimes some as big as a hundred thousand lives um, across you know east to west coast and what happened is it really showed me gave me an appreciation for how I used to um, make it stressful for her because mm-hmm. I would go out to these business meetings and I kept throwing things and then we wouldn't get back to it and we wouldn't talk about what was done. And then I would be off to another meeting. So creating the structure, uh, I think she was less um, irritated by my, my, my uh, communication style because really it wasn't that. Um, and then we were busy all the time and we weren't physically there. Mm-hmm. So I think once we started to talk about what was going well, which there was a lot that was going well, what was not going well. Um, and the need for structure, what, we, what I said to her is, let's implement the things that would help you 
get what you need from me more. And then I talked about what I needed from her in order to shine, you know, when I went out of those meetings. So there was a fair amount of growing pains when I think it took a good, I would say, for us to feel like we were in rhythm, probably a good three to four months of us talking about things um, and missing deadlines sometimes, those types of things, um, which, you know, would, and that at times, you know, ended up being in some service issues because we were still trying to figure things out. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that's hard when you're, when you're changing environments or structure of how you report. I found that difficult. And it was something that I really, really learned a lot about myself in reference to the kind of communicator that, that I was. Well, that sounds like a great learning experience, but and it's something that I think a lot of people go through because people are not mind readers. Whether you're working with one person in your team or you're working with multiple people, having to communicate ideas, having to make sure that your ideas are not misinterpreted, that there's no misunderstandings, that's so it can be so difficult because mm-hmm. we all have our own ideas in our heads, and it, it's so difficult to make sure that we we express that appropriately, in in especially when we're working remotely. So in terms of communicating remotely, I find that it does help to have um, some, some sort of standardization in terms of uh, set frequency of meetings um, mm-hmm. and then objectives of those, of those virtual meetings um, and then having some KPIs, knowing what your objectives are, that really helps. So setting the tempo for the meetings, how often you meet, what's going to be discussed there, and then what the objectives will be, and then having some debriefing afterwards. Uh, did you achieve what you set out to achieve? And then um, doing it again. Are we, are we going to are we going to make sure that we achieve what we achieved or what we want to achieve, and and so on and so forth? Uh, what can we do to make sure we keep doing the right things and, and move away from the things that we don't want to do? You know so what I found mo- the most difficult, Ron, is that when I was in the same building, I could read the nuances of what was happening with the person physically, uh, and what I so I was one of the first account executives to go virtual. And I remember there was a part of me that went to Toronto. So we we were in New Yorkville. (laughs) I would go. So I was virtual. So this is me because I'm a connector. I would go to Toronto and there would be, you know, I remember having this vivid memory of going into the boardroom and there was nobody there. And I went, all right. You know, there was one moderator um, and then we was an East to West coast meeting and then, you know, this, the directive of the company was, well, you don't physically need it to be there, but there was this need within me. <laughs> to, okay, I'm going to be there. And they said, okay, Roxanne, well, you don't need to be here. I'm like, really? You can go mm-hmm. back to your desk. So it was kind of like I was, you know, old school in that way. And I needed to get accustomed because I was so accustomed to getting connected in person. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. virtually, what are some of the things that keep, th- tips that you would give to someone that's running a remote team in reference to communication? I think it does help to have a video conference. So right yes. now we've got a video conference. I know you've got the audio recording, but I can see you nodding. I can see you smiling mm-hmm. and I can see when you're thinking. So that really helps me and I'm giving you time to pause. And I can, I can see when you're really coming up with something juicy or when I say something that you're reacting to, mm-hmm. I, that, that really helps to, to engage and to connect as well. So I think that it makes sense to think about the, the richness of the communication channel. Sometimes we can't communicate face to face, but the, the next best thing may be communicating on video, so we can hear the son, the tone, the, the tone of our voice. I was mixing up the word tone and sound. I'm not always a good communicator. <laughs> so the the tone of our voice, as well as the the our, our our expressions, and whether we use hand gestures to really emphasize something, are we happy or are we disgruntled? That that really makes a difference. So the richness of our communication channel can help. Sending emails, for example, can really hinder conversations. If your assistant was sending you messages and they were really, really detailed and you wanted to know what was the bigger picture and she was losing sight of that and you're going back and forth by email, that's not really helping because you're not achieving the goal of effective communication, of achieving shared meaning and shared understanding. So I remember doing a, a keynote and then a follow-up coaching session with, uh, with a client in Montreal, a large engineering firm, and they said um, that they weren't... Um, they were used to just sending emails to, in, internally and with clients. So you just pick up the phone. If you're in that situation mm-hmm. where there's a, a wall, there's clearly a barrier to communication. There's some misunderstanding, miscommunication. Just pick up the phone. You'll, you'll save yourself the headache mm-hmm. and you can reduce the amount of friction that happens as well because then you can hear each other's tones of voices and you can also respond to each other. You can ask questions from each other. You can really handle those issues immediately that may take 
multiple emails to resolve otherwise. You know, when you're, when you're dealing with sensitive issues, potentially emotionally loaded issues, emails are not the way to go mm -hmm. to, to communicate. Mm -hmm. So video conferencing, phone conversations, definitely, definitely a better way. When you're communicating by email, it's better to stick to announcements or sort of clarifications, sticking to the facts, for example, because you're not dealing with emotional or sensitive issues. And you, so can't, you, read, the, and you can't read the emotion in, in between the lines. No, not at all. Not at all. So that's where a phone call can help. It can help avoid mm -hmm. misunderstandings and miscommunication. And setting regular times, having a regular tempo for video conferencing with specific goals, KPIs, and then reviewing your objectives, that can really help you achieve your you know, alignment with your goals. Absolutely. And I think it's, you're right. Structure is important. Nuance, like, like, like you said, seeing you. I've, I mean, I'm always around you every month, so I know you, but to see you and see your reaction and how you're responding, I, I can tell, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on the mark. I'm not on the mark. He's being funny. He's not being funny. And I can read you. But if I'm not seeing you on an ongoing basis, you know, I would feel like, okay, well, I'm, I'm hearing his, his voice. Maybe I don't know him as well. But seeing that person, I, I know for me, it helps me um, kind of really get a sense of where that person's at. So that's definitely something that I would think that uh, in companies, are you doing a lot more communication um, because of the digital era with virtual teams? I'm doing more uh, intercultural communication these days than, okay. uh, than, than communicating using different technologies. Although there, there is a piece of that as well, especially okay. again with with virtual conferencing, with the videos, as well as communicating by email. But I find that the intercultural communication, people working in, in diverse teams, diverse backgrounds, diverse ethnic backgrounds, for example, uh, diverse abilities, that these are interesting elements right now in, in, in many organizations, small and large. So tell me more about that. Like, what are some of the concerns, the major concerns that come up in companies that you might go in to help with communication? Well, it could be that a, a team member or a group of people in the team are of different backgrounds and they don't say, speak uh, a common language or they have challenges in fitting in. For example, one of my students, his wife works in a, a large accounting firm in Toronto, came from Brazil. And apparently in Brazil, they're used to communicating a certain way. And in continuing to communicate in this way, um, this, this employee felt like, my student's wife felt like, she wasn't seen by her boss. She wasn't fitting in with her colleagues and she just didn't feel like she really belonged. And then once my student showed her my lessons on direct versus indirect communication, understanding the cultural differences, she made the, the mindset shift. And then she started applying some of those mechanics. Like she had the motivation to succeed at work, but some of the mechanics involved learning how to be more direct in, in, mm. in the business world. Previously, based on our cultural upbringing, it was the norm to sort of hint at things. Instead of coming around and asking for something or making a statement, mm -hmm. it was more about providing some background, some context, and then maybe dropping some hints or then saying something after this buffer. And unfortunately, with many employers, time is money. And it's kind of this Jerry Maguire situation, show me the money, <laughs> show me the money, time is money. And so it's important to recognize who we're communicating with. And if, if, if our boss or our boss's boss are type A type personalities and they really value time and they're really focused on productivity and really improving revenue or decreasing costs, then we have to make sure we communicate in that way as opposed to a long preamble and letting them you know, try to figure out and decipher what we're trying to say. They just don't have the time for that. They don't have the patience. So it's really important to understand how to communicate in this particular culture. And if people are working in a multinational company as well, then I think we have to understand the, the Western culture. Uh, that's the, the norm. So these are some of the things I talk about to help companies be more productive and to help them re remove some of the friction when dealing with teams just simply with different cultural upbringings, different expectations. So I would think that the, uh, the skill set of the manager that say has, a, say has a multinational team, let's say somebody is in Brazil and somebody's in Trinidad and somebody's in India, whatever, and that manager really has to be quite effective with understanding all the cultures, first of all, and the nuances within each culture, and they have to be the hub to be able to kind of uh, move them around effectively. Let's say it's implementing an IT program, um, you know, across the business. 
So that, that manager's skills, I would think, would have to be pretty um, high level so that they can kind of um, make everybody feel connected, uh, understand kind of, like you said, what, what, you know, what, what are the KPIs, um, if, if, if let's say, you know, I'm more indirect, helping me or assisting me to become more direct, if somebody's too direct, um, <laughs> so they don't seem like they're a bulldozer to have them kind of, you know, lay back a bit more, um, those types of things. So that's a lot of moving parts. You're right, Roxanne. Helping coach employees is, is, a, is a big challenge for modern organizations, I think, especially because of the diverse skill sets and also recognizing that companies don't have to be melt, melting pots the way that they mm. used to be. It's certainly a, a new challenge, but it's also a new opportunity. And that's why soft skills are so important now in leadership, more so than ever before. It's not just about meeting goals and, and achieving KPIs and whatnot, but it's also about coaching employees, empowering employees, and uh, making sure that uh, there's more collaboration in, in that culture. So I think that's important. And I think that um, it's also an opportunity for the employees to learn how to lead themselves. So as I mentioned mm -hmm. before, not all managers have those skills, mm -hmm. as, as you pointed out. And the opportunity then is for the employee to learn how to manage their, their manager, how to communicate upwards. If they recognize that that's the opportunity, they, they need to have that awareness, first of all, that some friction exists, and then recognizing potential tools that can help them address that problem. As, as my student's wife discovered at this accounting firm in Toronto, in order to get along better with her boss, with her colleagues, she had to adjust her communication style. style. But first, she had to recognize that a problem existed mm -hmm. and that it was within her control to affect how she got along. And once she became more direct in her communication, when appropriate, then she found that balance and she, she fit in just fine. Her, her boss recognized her, her employees, her colleagues really paid her more respect. They really understood her. She fit in a lot better. So that's an interesting thing that I often think about. We talk about communication down, but we don't often talk about what do I need to do to be able to communicate up? And I think that's a fascinating concept, right? Because if you're my, if you're my uh, direct, uh, if, if I'm your direct report and I'm not getting my needs met, let's say, uh, based on our styles or whatever, I have to be able to be quote unquote, I'm going to say brave enough if I have a cultural um, impediment to be able to come to you without feeling like I'm being disrespectful or um, those types of things. And I know a lot of cultures, that's, that's a difference compared to North America. Like I'm Trinidadian and I would say that a lot of, uh, you know, in Trinidadian culture, it's very indirect. And, and at times I would even say, and I'm sure I'm going to get flack for this, at times passive aggressive, <laughs> potentially, right? Where they might talk about something, but they're not really talking about that thing. And you're supposed to, in, you know, intuit that that's what they're saying. And then you come to North America and I moved here when I was 16 and then everybody was just so direct, you know? And I was like, whoa, that's, that's different because at times at home, it would might be considered a bit rude to yeah. be that direct, right? So it's kind of learning that skill. And then it took years and years to realize that it's really, in fact, not rude, but it's just about telling the person what, what's happening for you and helping them understand you um, and to be able to kind of facilitate um, understanding back and forth. But that's a, that was a tough thing. I came as a teenager, obviously, which was a different stage in age, but it was something that I had to learn to get more comfortable with. Yeah, and, and it's, it's good that you recognized it quickly and that you were able to adjust over time because if you're very indirect in a, in a direct world, then it can be really difficult to fit in. It can be really mm -hmm. difficult to be understood and it can be really difficult to get things done. And mm -hmm. As you mentioned, people may take offense and maybe you may take offense as well. So yeah. things don't have to be that way. Right, for sure. So with, with globalization, um, what, what are some of the things that maybe companies should be thinking about in reference to cross-cultural uh, communication? What are, are there some kind of, big concepts that companies should be kind of keeping in mind um, as they kind of create maybe uh, the infrastructure as they expand into different parts of the world? I think it can be helpful to think about the identity of the employees as being individuals um, so that people don't think about certain groups, <clears throat> ethnic groups, people from certain backgrounds as all being certain stereotypes. Mm, right. it, it helps have an open mind um, and recognize that, <clears throat> excuse me, Sorry, it helps to have an open mind and to recognize that our identity is based not just on our appearance, 
but also on our skill set, our unique experiences, the people that we know, the people we've met, the books that we've read, the places mm-hmm. we've gone, and so on and so forth. But many of us are often thinking in terms of, uh, we, we often see in terms of skin tone or hair color or, mm-hmm. or gender, for example. And then we automatically make some shortcuts, some assumptions. And recognizing when these, these thoughts happen um, and then trying to recognize that people are different can really help us in our communication. It can help uh, companies as well. So by having some training uh, and to increase awareness and to also recognize how some commonalities exist among people from certain genders or backgrounds can help us understand how certain behaviors are acceptable in some cultures and uh, to help us reach a, a greater sense of understanding uh, together. So for example, do you have any brothers or sisters, Roxanne? I have one brother and uh, three sisters. Oh, wow. I'm an only child. <laughs> but, oh, uh, my God. And I lost a sibling. So I grew up in a family of six. Uh, very, very busy, loud house <laughs> compared, to your, compared to your <laughs> home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. My, my parents, though, they had, they had a lot of siblings. My mom is number 10 in her family. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely on the other end. Uh, but <laughs> the reason why I ask is because I'm wondering, are your, you know, would you say that your brothers and sisters, even though you live in the same household, you live in the same area, uh, you know, same skin color, I'm guessing, do, do, are they different or are they the same as you? Oh, no, we're all very different. You're I, all I very different. I would say that maybe there's one sibling that I think would be, um, maybe have some qualities like myself, but I would think that each one of us is very, very different. So isn't that interesting then when you, you, you grew up in the same area, you share the same culture, um, perhaps you, you, you grew up in the same generation, but yet you, you have such different characteristics. Mm-hmm. So when we often make blanket assumptions about people based on their skin color or their gender, we're doing the same thing. But mm-hmm. if we have brothers or sisters, or we know people who have brothers or sisters, sisters, we know that they're all different based on their own I- identity. So there may be some commonalities based on where they grew up and sort of the cultural norms. Um, and there may be some similarities based on gender. But when it comes to individual personalities or behaviors or life experiences, education, and so on and so forth, that's some of the unique elements of our personalities, of our, of our identity. So recognizing that, having that awareness when we're communicating and awareness of ourselves in that respect can really help us when we're, we're, we're speaking to individuals. But at the same time, when we recognize a pattern, if someone's from Trinidad and they're indirect, then sort of recognizing that can help us as well. Mm-hmm. Knowing if we're speaking in high context or low context. Does it matter the background, the body language, knowing the, knowing the, the relationship and the history, does that matter in the conversation or is it more direct? What you see is what you, what you understand. What you say is all that matters. Mm-hmm. Understanding those nuances can really help. But with the reminder that our identity is a combination of all these elements, our cultural background, our gender, and then our unique, our unique elements, unique personalities. Actually, my thesis and my master's was on cross-cultural communication. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, and not that I've, you know, kind of talked about high context, so context, but like, I mean, just to even understanding, and I did my grad work in the U.S., so even that element, um, you know, understanding all those nuances to communication is very, very key. Um, and then going out there, right, like to, and being able to, when I worked, I worked with the Metro Toronto Police. And what they would do is they would save sometimes the um, Trinidadian cases for me, like if I was on shift, because there, there'd be an element of affinity to the same culture, but sometimes it, w- it was very different, you know, because I'm, my contacts, yes, certain things were the same, but oftentimes a lot of it was very different. So that really speaks to your point, right? It, you know, in my family, there's such diversity. So in a company, even though it may be all, the commonality may be that they're all engineers, maybe they're potentially male or female, um, you know, they're living in different parts of the world, all those things. So I think individuality, like you're saying, is, is key when you're really kind of thinking of the context of cross-cultural communication, um, you, know, you know, based on the company that you're in. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But it does help to have some awareness of some of the commonalities and the patterns to, so that we could potentially adjust or understand them better and sort of where they're coming from. 
How did you get interested in cross-cultural and well, cultural you know, communication? I just, I just, it was something that I just was interested in. And, um, you know, what I found the most fascinating at that time, do you, you remember that Rodney King um, issue that that in, was in Los so Angeles? That, I'm going to date myself. <laughs> I, I graduated grad school in 1994. And that was like a big thing that we dissected kind of the interactions and those types of things. And then just understanding um, communication was key. Uh, you know, as a psychotherapist, I wanted to understand it. And then there was the element that I just was fascinated. And I'm, I'm from a different culture. So coming and to Canada when I was already grown up, it really helped me understand a lot of things. Um, and I was just fascinated by it, by, you know, um, you know, how miscommunications could happen and all those things. So it was just one of those things that I got drawn towards. And I think it just helped me understand myself better. Um, mm. But also when I would go out in the various roles that I had played and even in corporate, when I would go out to different environments, some of my companies um, that I would deal with would be completely diverse. Right. Um, you know, so that was an interesting lens, lens to also um, go in and understand kind of what the needs of the, the employee base was, too. So it, it just uh, it was just one of those things that I enjoyed and uh, um, you know, and, you know, hadn't really thought about it until we just started to talk f further about it. So I love it. I'm learning new things about you, Roxanne. Yes, we are. So Mr. Mr. Uh, President, you'll know more about me as we, we get together on the weekend in London. Uh, we have our, our national meeting. So we're going to be spending some time with uh, with Ron. I'm now part of the board and, and truly honored to be part of the CAPS board. It's a privilege so, to have you, Roxanne. Looking you. forward to a great year with you. Yes, me as well. I'm, I'm looking forward to learning a lot. So Ron, is there anything that you'd like to share about communication or, or cross-cultural communication or even a kind of the digitalization of communication before we let you go? I guess I can recommend my book from presentation to standing ovation. It's available on Amazon uh, as a paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Awesome. So if you don't mind listening to the sound of my voice for three hours, you can, you can listen to me in your car on Audible. Awesome. Well, you've got a great voice. I'm sure they would, uh, would enjoy it. So Ron, I guess what I'm learning, um, what I learned today is about mechanics, motivation, and mindset. I love that. So I'm going to think more about myself as I kind of go out there and communicate um, with uh, the different environments that I am in. When I'm speaking to my audience, you know, to really pivot accordingly um, so that's something that I'm really taking away. And hopefully the others um, listening are, there's some snippet that they're taking away also. So again, I go back to, you know, everybody's individual and they are unique. And to really tap into what makes that person unique in front of you. And all your information is right there. And sometimes you're going to get it right on. And sometimes you're going to have to apologize and go back again and say, oh, I think I did. I made an error there. And ask the question again and, and you know, use all the information that's in front of you. So, Ron, thanks so much again for uh, giving me your time and for everyone listening. Um, so, if, if, if you're needing anything further from me, uh, you know, you can reach me at roxanderhodge.com. You know, I speak on authenticity and leadership. And um, again, thank you for your time. Roxanne, thanks so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. All right, Ron. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.